The History of Poland, Episode 8. What is a Legacy? Hello once more. You may have noticed a few weeks have gone by between this episode and the last one. Well, I did have this episode mostly ready to go, but unfortunately I found out that there was another manuscript out there that covered some of what we're going to talk about today. So, I ordered a copy of it and it took some time to arrive. I didn't want to speak on the subject without all of my first-hand sources in place, but now we're ready to go. Apologies for the delay, but I hope you understand my reasoning. For some reason, a compilation of historical letters from Imperial Germany in the 11th century doesn't ship with Amazon Prime. It's crazy how these things work. Anyway, during our last episode, we spent a great deal of time talking about Boleslav and his short reign in Kiev, and the episode before that, we spent time covering Boleslav's suit with the Holy Roman Empire. Now, though, having settled the foreign affairs of the Polish state, we should turn our attention to the internal dynamics and answer a few fundamental questions. What was life like in Boleslav's Poland? What was his relationship with the nobles and the church? What was his family like? And lastly, what is the legacy of Boleslav of Poland? These are all deep, thought-provoking questions, but before we jump into them, I wanted to share a quick update about the show. I have three things to say. First, thank you to everyone that left a review on iTunes. I read them all and appreciated the time you took to write them. Second, due to a very generous gift from a family member, the History of Poland podcast now has a really nice microphone. If you like the sound of my voice, you'll now hear it more clearly. If you don't, then I'm confused on how you made it to episode 8. Lastly, I spent some time putting together a new website for the podcast. It's still just getting started, but if you'd like to have a place where you can browse accompanying images, stay in touch, or even donate... Now you can. There were a few people who were looking for a place to send me a couple of bucks, which is incredibly generous, so if you'd like to help cover the cost of buying old manuscripts and hosting these podcast files online, you can do it there. I'll be adding in some pages of sources, bibliographies, a way to contact me, and if there's any interest, I could turn on comments and we could make this more collaborative. You guys just let me know. You can find the website at historyofpolandpodcast.com. That's historyofpolandpodcast.com. Link in the show notes. Now, on to our episode. As we well know, Poland under Bolesław was a war-making state. This makes sense, since as it's described in the Cambridge History of Poland, quote, annual expeditions for human and material plunder were essential to the economy of the early medieval state. But Piast Poland, with a population of probably below a million in lands densely tangled by forests, swamps, and heaths, could not sustain such efforts indefinitely, end quote which means that while war was necessary for survival, at a certain point, Bolesław would make peace, return home to his lands to oversee his people, and rule. But what did that ruling look like? To answer that question, one source we have is our old friend, Gallus Anonymous. Just as a reminder, I like to take Gallus' stories with a decently sized grain of salt. It's not that he's just making things up, but instead that he tends to either exaggerate the good quality of certain Polish rulers, or ignore their worst qualities. He's still worth listening to, but it's best to balance his tales with other accounts. The picture Gallus paints of Boleslav is one of an inspired ruler that would bend his ear towards anyone that was in trouble, provide for those in need, treat people fairly, and generally be a great guy to hang around. For example, at one point Gallus tells how Boleslav would respond to the complaint of a peasant, even if the peasant was complaining against a noble person. According to Gallus, quote, he had such a great sense of justice and a special humility that if some poor peasant or some ordinary woman came with a complaint against any duke or count, no matter how important the matters he was engaged in, amid the throng and press of his lords and officers, he would not stir from the spot before he had heard the full account of the complaint and sent a chamberlain to fetch the lord against whom the complaint had been made. Meanwhile, he let the aggrieved person in the care of one of his retainers, who would take his part and would help him with his plea while the adversary was coming. And so he would advise the peasant as a father would his son, so that he would not make a groundless accusation against the absent party, nor by complaining unjustly load upon himself the anger he was directing against the other. Moreover, the accused would never fail to come with all speed when he was summoned, and never for any reason neglect to appear on the day appointed by Boleslav. When the great man who had been sent for arrived, Boleslav would never show him anger or ill will, but would welcome him in a warm and friendly way and invite him to a meal and wait till the second or even the third day before broaching the matter of contention. So he treated a poor man's problem with as much concern as if he had been a great prince. What great wisdom, 
what great accomplishment to Boleslav. He passed judgment regardless of person, he governed the people with such justice, and he set the dignity of the church and the state of the country above all else. His sense of justice and fairness raised Boleslav to such glory and dignity, the virtues by which the Romans in the beginning rose to power and empire. Such was the prowess, the power, and the victories which Almighty God bestowed on Boleslav in recognition of the goodness and justice which Boleslav showed to him and to his fellow men. Boleslav enjoyed all the glory, abundance, and happiness that his worthiness and generosity deserved. End quote. So that's Boleslav's way of ruling, kind and patient. However, Gallus also tells an interesting tale about Boleslav's tendency towards forgiveness. At great length, Gallus tells us about Boleslav's wife. He doesn't indicate which of Boleslav's wives this is, but historians seem to think that it was either Emnilda, who was married to Boleslav for the longest period of time, or Oda, who would fit into the chronology of Gallus' story. However, historians also think that there's a chance this story is more of a composite picture of Boleslav's relationships with his wives, and is put into Gallus' chronicle because it helps explain the general reputation of Boleslav. Whether or not the story really happened is up for debate. Regardless, the story goes that if Boleslav sentenced someone to death because of some crime they committed, his wife would, quote, save them at the last minute from the threat of death. She would leave them under guard in the prison, their lives preserved through her mercy. At times, Boleslav did not know of this, and at times, he would pretend not to. End quote. The story then continues that Boleslav would be feasting, and through some turn of the conversation, the person that Boleslav thought he had executed would be brought up. Boleslav would feel remorse, and at that moment his wife would ask if he wanted to bring them back to life. He would say he would, the condemned would be let out of their cells, and all would be happy after Boleslav would pardon them. Now, who knows if that really happened? But personally, I think it's a useful story because it helps show us what Boleslav's reputation was, if not the exact historical day-to-day -day life he lived. In Gallus' words, quote, such was Boleslav's way of treating the people and the princes, and thus through his wise ways he caused himself to be both feared and loved by all who were subject to him. End quote. So it seems that Boleslav was a pretty decent ruler. Though without first-hand access to his court and his letters, it's going to be impossible to judge for certain one way or the other. But there are a few pieces of information we can use to judge his success and popularity. The first is that there isn't a record of any revolts against him during his rule. The second is that he was generally successful in his international adventures, which traditionally increases domestic popularity in a nation. And thirdly, that he successfully crowned himself King of Poland in 1025. Yes, folks, we're finally there. The coronation of Bolesław of Poland. Before we jump right in, there's one thing we need to ask. Why did the coronation happen now and not earlier or later? Well, the answer seems to be pretty straightforward. It seems to be that the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry, died in 1024, and there was an immediate successor in place. Instead, while Henry's successor Conrad would become King of Germany in 1024, he wouldn't be crowned Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire until 1027. So there's a brief period here where Boleslav can become King of Poland, and if challenged, can just meekly reply, well, there wasn't an emperor to ask, so I just did it. Which isn't to say that he didn't ask permission of anyone. After all, this is no Napoleon. Instead, Boleslav asked and received permission from the Pope. Permission slip in hand, Boleslav headed on over to Gniezno, the same place where years earlier he wined and dined Otto III. We don't know the exact circumstances of the coronation, what it looked like, who attended, or what happened, but we know that when he left that cathedral, he was the first king of Poland. Boleslav the Brave. I've been impatiently waiting for this moment for a few episodes now. That's because I didn't want to call him king, since that wasn't technically true until now. But at the same time, the histories are all looking backwards and call him king the entire time, which makes it kind of hard to quote from them without slightly editing it where it says king and I replace it with the name Boleslav. It's all very misleading. The troubles I go through to get this podcast published with accuracy. But anyway, we've got a king now. But not everyone was thrilled with this. According to a letter sent shortly after by the chronicler Vipo of Burgundy, quote, In the same year which I have mentioned above, Boleslav of the Slavs, Duke of the Poles, took for himself an injury to King Conrad, the regal insignia, and the royal name. Death swiftly killed his temerity. End quote. So, Vipo thought this was an insult to Conrad. However, it's hard to say due to the lack of primary objective sources. Even if he was wrong, though, it's very likely that not everyone was pleased that Poland now had a centralized king, seeing as the country pretty quickly fell apart following his death. But king he was, and would remain so for the rest of his reign. Disappointingly for Boleslav, this reign wasn't particularly long. After being coronated in 1025, 
Bolesław continued to rule Poland with his same old tactics. He tried to keep a firm hold over his borders, tried to make sure his son was in place to succeed him, and according to Thietmar, even sent envoys to the emperor of the Byzantine Empire asking for friendship. Then, suddenly, as Vipo stated, death quickly came for Bolesław. In 1025, on June the 17th, shortly after becoming the first king of Poland, Bolesław died. It appears that it was from an unexpected illness, which really means it could have just been about anything that wasn't easily explained. He was 58 years old and had ruled Poland on his own for 33 years. His legacy is hard to define, but on the whole, he seemed to be what Poland needed at that time. A strong central ruler that could solidify the borders of the nation, stand up to foreign powers, establish Poland as a nation in its own right, and do so with homegrown authenticity. At the same time, he was far, far, far away from being perfect, and it's likely that the sources we have put him in too glowing of a light. It's very difficult to look back at historic rulers and consider whether or not they could be called, quote, good. After all, we aren't there, there aren't many objective measures we can rely on, and we quickly get into a game of alternate history if we imagine someone else in the same role. But there are two questions to ask about rulers that help frame the discussion. The first is if they were better, on whichever measure you choose, relative to the rulers who came directly before them and directly after them. In this, Boleslav seems to get a passing mark. The second question is if the succession from one ruler to the next is without incident. If it is, it's a good sign they had a firm control on the levers of power, people liked their reign, and they wanted to see more of it by following the designated successor, who would presumably follow the same policies. If it's a bumpy transition, then it's likely the opposite of those things. On this question, Boleslav does not get high marks. In fact, in the words of Gallus, who tells of a very dramatic deathbed scene that almost certainly didn't happen, Boleslav's passing is best described as an age of gold becoming an age of lead. Yes, everyone, as Gallus says, quote, Poland, once queen and crowned with radiant golden gems, sits in the dust wrapped in the garments of her widowhood. Her harp is turned to mourning, her joy to sorrow, and her organ music to sighs. For all through that year of Boleslav's death, no one celebrated a public feast in Poland, no noble man or woman dressed in formal attire, no clapping or sound of stringed instruments was heard in the taverns, no girls sang songs, nor did any voice of happiness echo in the streets. This year of mourning was universally observed by all, but noblemen and women never ceased to weep for Boleslav till the day of their death. So when King Boleslav passed from the world of men, it seemed as if peace and happiness and abundance departed from Poland at the same time. At this point, let us bring to an end our praise of the great Boleslav. End quote. And that is where we're going to stop for this week. Boleslav has passed from the scene with a mixed legacy, and a period of lead is about to begin when Boleslav's son and descendants take up the throne. We'll see if they can hold on to it without being thrown off. And just as a reminder, as I mentioned, please check out the new website at historyofpolandpodcast.com. Send me an email at historyofpolandpodcast at gmail.com with thoughts on the website or the show or anything you want to talk about. And subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcasting app. Thanks. I'll see you next week.